Welcome everyone. I'm Jay LaPlante, Artistic Director of Doc NYC, and welcome to Doc NYC's Spring Showcase presentation of Wildlife. Uh, special thanks to National Geographic Documentary Films for making today's conversation possible. And I am thrilled to welcome our filmmakers, Chai Vassarelli and Jimmy Chin, um, to this conversation. Um, welcome, Chai and Jimmy. Thank you for having us. So happy to be here. Um, so I wanted to start off as as wildlife was unfolding. Um, I at first had this had the impression that the film was a little bit of a departure from your other films together, such as you know, of course, Free Solo and the, and the, the Rescue. And um, but but as the story took hold for me, it then occurred to me that that wildlife is actually really a very beautiful extension of one of the the major themes of of your work, which is you know, to me, a, a, a passionate individual undertaking a monumental task against, you know, incredible odds. I was wondering if if you um, both see wildlife that way, and, and if so, at what point in the project did the story um, start to shape itself that way for you? And, and uh, maybe we'll start with you, Chai. I think it's absolutely an extension of this inquiry that Jimmy and I have, like, dedicated our careers first independently and then now together um, about this question of, you know, the idea of human potential, like what is, like, what is an audacious dream? Like, what does it look like to strive to realize that? That said, you know, I think it was also like a welcome departure in that, you know, Chris Tompkins is this like remarkable woman and it's all about second chances, like this idea of regeneration. And it was a, like, you know, it's kind of a slight diversion in that just, you know, most of our, protect, our main participants have been men. And, you know, so like, I, I just found like, Chris moved us both. So in so many different ways, which is kind of where, what our jam is, like where we intersect is like, if we're both moved in different ways, it makes it something that we absolutely have to say yes to in terms of being a film. How about you, Jimmy? How, how would you see that that evolution? Yeah, I, I think it is an extension of kind of the themes that we've always been really interested in. Uh, like you mentioned, you know, having an audacious dream and achieving it against all odds. And that was part of the story that really struck me long before we even started making the film because I met Chris and Doug in 2008 and uh besides the fact that you know I I could see that there was this incredible love and devotion between the two of them like a striking you know amount <laughs> and uh but I was also struck by the fact that they were these hugely successful um, people in, in the business world. And they had left it all behind and moved to this remote valley in, in Chile um, and that they had this, this dream. And in 2008, it, it really seemed far away to achieve what they were trying to do. Uh, and it took some time for me to understand how they see the world. It's not, oh yeah, we're going to achieve this in a year or three years or five years. They are thinking long game, like really long game. I mean, they worked on it for 25 years. Um, but I think, you know, I, we also love stories about courage. And this, this is a film about courage too. It's a film about people who aren't willing to settle and have the courage to live the idealized life that they have in their minds and uh, and and they're willing to make pretty significant pivots and take those risks in order to kind of live the life that they think is purposeful and meaningful. Mm. How did Chris react when you first approached her with the idea of, of making, you know, her the center of a feature documentary? I mean, you mentioned you've known her a long time, but you know that's a significant shift. Is you know, like I want to make my next film about you. How, how did she react? Was she reticent at first at all? Or, well, it was funny because if you ask Chris, like, how you know, how did this all start? 
And she, she'll she say, Jimmy just started showing up, which is kind of true. Like I, I just started showing up in Patagonia and filming with her because, you know, Chai and I hadn't really committed to making a film. And I think she started to sense that there was some momentum and eventually we did have to, you know, really con confront it and say, okay, you know, I think, I think we, we really want to make this film with you. Uh, and, you know, she is of a generation along with Yvonne and Rick and, um, and Doug, but Doug had passed by the time we were really kind of committed in the film, making the film, but they're, they're of the generation where it's say less, do more. And while they did have kind of public personas being founders and CEOs of a, of a big brand, their personal lives was very private. And, you know, we're very upfront about what, you know, we, how we make films and that, you know, we also need a full commitment from, from them um, to participate. And I think it, took a little bit of time, but uh, because of our kind of relationship before we started making the movie and we had, you know, um, th they had seen our track record and they, uh, and Chris, I think, trusted us to, uh, to go for it. And she's, obviously very savvy and smart. She, she, she knows what it means. She knew what it would mean. I mean, I always think being a participant in a film that's about you, I mean, it's it's gotta be very, very challenging. I mean, you have to open up everything, right? And, and she knew that. Um, so she committed. And as you know, as you were shooting over the years and sort of you know beginning to collect material, what kind of conversations um, did you and and Chai together have as filmmakers? You know, when did you realize that this was going to be your next film, and and how 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 did that process evolve? Maybe maybe we could start with you, Chai. I mean, we have very different answers to this particular one because I never want to make a movie. Period. Um, I just feel like but you're you know, so good at it. <laughs> but that's kind of the point, right? Is that I don't know how many films I'm going to make in my life, right? And we have two amazing kids. Um, Jimmy loves like pursuing his his careers in, as a professional athlete and spending time in the outdoors. And the point is that you know, you kind of know, it's like getting married again every single time where you know you have to give it all and it has to be great. You have to get, you have to know you did your best. So what, what compels you to make that decision, right? Like what, so from like, I can think only for myself where, you know, I understood that Chris Tompkins, Doug Tompkins, and Yvonne Chouinard were really important people in Jimmy's life in that they were the icons of the, you know, the beginnings of the outdoor industry and now look where Esprit was or the North Face is and Patagonia is. And whereas me having grown up in Manhattan, I'm like, you know, it's kind of one of those situations where like, you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. And the damned if you do was like more compelling in the beginning because that's the whole thing. You back up into a movie, like, you know, it's important, you know, it's interesting. You don't know if you have the the right environment to make the proper film or the right relationships to make a proper film. But then as each year went by and then Doug died, um, it became very clear that this story was so, so important. And then for and twofold, one, as I said earlier, like I was incredibly compelled about this idea of a woman, or of a person who finds a second chance. And both, both of them did, right? Like Doug, was at the height of his career. He had founded this, the like kind of the first aspirational major brand in, in, in Esprit. They were all over the world. And he's like, I can still do more for the earth, which was like quite counterculture at the moment, right? Like that's a hard decision to make. And he leaves a family. He, leave, he just goes to Patagonia, which is a very remote place. And then for Chris, who had, you know, built 
she was the first CEO of the Patagonia company, which is now worth $3 billion. And she had grown up in it. So she was just like, she had started really early. She was young. And then she'd spent 20 something years there. And she, like, as she says in the film, like, I was going to die here, but not die, like die, but die. Does it make sense? Like, I too can do more. And then she finds love of her life later in life, right? And then the worst thing happens in the world. She loses the love of her life 25 years later. And she's she's faced with these like very difficult decisions about, you know, selling the places that they spent their happiest lives, the happiest years of their lives together, you know, of, you know, kind of picking herself up and trying to fulfill this audacious vision. So it's just the idea was, so one, it was about, again, this idea of regeneration or second chances. And secondly, like we had lived through a pandemic and we began making this film before the pandemic, or we began thinking about the film before the pandemic. But for me, like this is the film for our children where, you know, climate change is the existential crisis of our time. And it's scary. And I've seen like these small people who are like under nine years old being really, really scared. And, you know, here is a story that's hopeful and it really, you know, lays out that just put one foot in front of the other and do something. And doing that something is what we can do. And that's okay. You know, it may not be buying up this land and then leveraging it with the government and, you know, achieving the largest private land donation in history, but it's something. And so the point is like the agency and the intentionality. And so it was like, you know, months, years, Jimmy and I were flirting with the idea. And finally, it just was like, it was something we had to do. And so that's why you decide to go like, give everything you have to try to make the film the best it can be. Jimmy Chai mentioned that your answer might be different. What, 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 when did the story start to become a film for you in your mind? I think, I, I can't remember the exact moment, but I did know probably in 2016 when I went down to Patagonia and Chris uh, was meeting with President Bachelet for the first time where it sounded, you know, like there was some serious consideration that uh, they might be moving forward on the park. And I had gone down there originally to go climb Cerro Cristina with Chris, but because of the meeting that we had to cancel the climb and I told Chris, well, if you're having this really important meeting, I'll just come down with uh, a friend and, and, and one camera and just kind of cover it for posterity. And it was during that time when I was down there that I thought, wow, they might pull this off. And if they do, it will be, you know, one of the greatest kind of environmental victories and stories of hope around the environment that um, I can think of. And Chris was also still deeply grieving. And I was, I was really, really moved um, by her fortitude to kind of press forward despite, you know, this huge, massive loss. She calls it an amputation, you know. And and it was, it felt very raw. Um, and whenever I think as a filmmaker, you, you feel it, you feel that rawness and you, and, and you have a sense that something's really happening. Um, that's when I, I started thinking about it. That's when I came back and talked to Chai about it. And I think we both understood that at the heart of the film was this love story and that this could be a story about um, something hopeful around the environment that it could be a story that was moving um, and inspiring to people, but it's a documentary. So you don't know where it's going to end. You know, the story is revealing itself. I think it started picking up momentum uh, as, as the kind of national parks idea was also gaining momentum in Chile. And so we were following closely and we were making forays down to Patagonia to film with Chris and Rick and uh, and Chris kept inviting me down to go climb Cerro Cristina. Um, 
and every time something came up that was showing that the that the park's idea was is was still moving forward so i think at some point you know um chai and i decided okay this is this is something that could be really powerful we have a platform let's take this thing on and see where it goes are so the the national parks or the 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 preserves that that the the Tonkins have been able to create are they do they have um a, a model that's specific to to you know Chile or Argentina that's you know maybe different from the way we experience national parks in in the US or um was there a lot of negotiation to go you know as part of a, that process like what do, what do national parks look like are they are they the same i mean you know a, or are they different is this a new like is national park kind of a new thing in that part of the world or what was See, the legacy the point of the national park is that different from preserve a nature preserve or um or not or national forest even is that a national park is protected by the constitution of chile and argentina so it's not you know, people change constitutions, but that was their goal. Was that the best they could do was pr to protect this land under the constitution of this com of this country. And I think that he was very much working off the models of Yellowstone National Park and Yosemite National Park and a lot of big American national parks where it is about the land, but it's also about access and about creating, you know, you think about the, you know, um, you think about, um, Gosh, I'm just blanking, Jimmy. The the hotel in, not the like the what is Awani. it? Yeah, the Awani in in Yosemite, which has been there for like 100 years, and like it's like it's creating the infrastructure that allows normal people to get there. And so Doug spent, especially Doug, spent a lot of his time trying to create these like lasting this lasting infrastructure to allow access um, to the parks, but. You know, their real thing was like, you know, Patag these places in Patagonia, both Chile and Argentina are incredibly remote, incredibly rugged, incredibly difficult to get to. And so it was about protecting this land itself, but also creating the infrastructure that could sustain like viable tourism and allowing normal people to, you know, enter the parks. And also I think for Doug, a really important part of this was awakening people to this place that's always been inaccessible you know and doug was responsible for several kind of like activations which said like like opened up the idea of patagonia that it's there you may it's maybe really hard to get to but you can get to it and we can make it better to get to it but it actually is part of your national pride it's about your national identity and that was very much modeled on his ideas of what america had done with its national parks yeah, because these are treasures you know like the national parks in the united states they are kind of like the gems of the country, right? Some of the most beautiful, iconic landscapes uh, we have in the United States, an incredible natural resource. Uh, we've done a really good job in the United States of providing, sometimes some people argue too good of a job, but you know that public access was something that was hugely important. And it was also, I mean, building the trails and building the infrastructure and the buildings and the headquarters, um, lodging, uh, campsites, you know, the signage, I mean, all of it, so that they literally built national parks, you know, and that was the leverage that they had, because that is such an incredible amount of work and requires so much vision. And I think they borrowed from the best ideas that they could find of the national parks in the United States, and they, they built that um, down in Chile, and then they were able to leverage that by saying, okay, well, we built this infrastructure, we built these national parks, so for every acre that we have preserved, we are asking the government to donate nine acres, and of course, you know, they're handing over the keys to this turnkey, like, national parks, that's the leverage that they had and what they built. And with hundreds of Chileans and after years of work of kind of working with the, the local townships and people in the area, 
um, to convince them that this is this is going to build a new economy for them as well. Uh, they had buy-in from from everybody, which that really took the most time, right? And then uh, they were able to leverage it and have the government come in, and that's why they were able to do something so much bigger. You know, it's kind of brilliant you know, business thinking, you know, they, they were able to scale it in a way that would have been impossible if they had just done it on their own. Um, they're smart, you know, and that's, that's how they pulled it off. But the parks are unbelievably beautiful. I mean, that's, and I think what's been really interesting to hear as we have screened the film down in Chile, like the reception of the film and the pride in which Chileans feel about these national parks, they're proud of these national parks. You know, they're proud that they have some of the, the highest, you know, percentage of their country preserved and protected at the highest level in, by the constitution because it's a national park um, than anywhere in the world. You know, it's, it's really, really incredible. And so they're their sense of the country even and their natural resources has even changed because of the work that Chris and Doug have done. Yeah, the character, the, the, the parks are really like another character in the film, you know, especially the way you've, you photographed them. It's, it's, it's so extraordinary. Um, I was also really happy to have learned through the film about the rewilding efforts. Um, now, is that uh, are those organizations that you know existed before Chris and Doug began their work, or did they really inspire them, uh, like on, on a local level, getting local activists involved, or how did those organizations evolve vis-a-vis um, -vis the work that Chris and, and, and Doug were doing? I mean, rewilding is a pretty like cutting edge part of environmentalism right now, and really, for as Chris says in the film, is that you know, like, like landscapes or, or land without you know animals wow. well, yeah. without wildlife is just scenery and she began to understand that they were missing like the set like you know the most interesting parts of the of the landscape and so you know that it was very much a, like quite a i don't know like forward facing like like very interesting part of their work that they realized like it was very very ambitious to try to reintroduce the jaguar and this was doug's original idea but chris saw it to fruition and i have to say it's it's one of the most exciting parts about thompson's conservation and what is also quite moving about this is that basically thompson's conservation then it kind of splintered like broke itself apart to become local organizations so rewilding chile and rewilding argentina are there are they are local national organizations and but they like Tompkins conservation provided the funds and the vision to you know to start them yeah and the truth is like they're now working on over two they've reintroduced over two dozen new species and like personally i'm happy to watch a giant anteater for hours like like i would happily like i'm like should we can i have one like can we just watch him like i mean it's amazing it's delightful and when chris in the film you know, says like it brings her to tears every time she thinks about the jaguars. It's true. Like she's like you're watching on these crazy cameras, like these, you know, the reintroduction of a species, but they're like, they're like babies. Like it's 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 a, it's totally amazing. It's like it's like um, planet Earth, but better. So. Yeah, I mean, if you ask Chris, uh, what is the most important aspect of the work that they do moving forward? By far, she's like, we're not in the business of making national parks. We've done that. We're in the business of rewilding because rewilding as a concept, it's about making that entire system whole. And, you know, I think they realized that when you protect habitat for the wildlife, you are, that is, that is the way forward in fighting the climate crisis because when you, are saving habitat and rewilding and completing an ecosystem. It allow it it makes that ecosystem um, stronger and more resilient and whole, which 
is basically creating wilderness again in its full state. Um, and it's a holistic way of looking at, you know, fighting climate change because these are ultimately going to be the most important carbon sinks that we have left in the world. Um, you know, we can talk about all these different technological solutions of trying to solve the issue, um, but nature at scale, the lungs of the earth are what are going to save us from ourselves, really. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one thing I just love about this film, it's, you know, there's a, a lot of environmental um, films right now that that are, you know, warn us about what we're going to lose. But I think what wildlife does is show us what we're going to keep. You know, why, why what it is that we want to keep. And so, we can gain, gain yeah, back. Yeah, gain, exactly. It's exactly. gaining back. Yeah. So, uh, so that brings me to sort of my last question, which is, you know, what impact are you hoping that wildlife will have on um, just, you know, the everyday viewer, like not the person who can't buy land and donate it to a national park, or the person who can't, you know, quit their job and and become um, a, a rewilder? But like, what what impacts do you, do you hope this has on on, on the everyday viewer? Jimmy, you're so articulate in this. Why don't you take this? Well, I just mean. We have been so inspired by Chris and Doug and Yvonne and Rick and the ethos in which they live by is something that I aspire to. Uh, I think it it in the most basic sense, just this idea of like this ethos of what can I do? What can I do to to help? And you have to remember, they have very, you know, simple roots. They were the original climbing bums. This is a group of climbing bums, surf bums, and ski bums that went out. And look at what impact they had on the world. That can also be a bit intimidating and overwhelming. I think the idea, though, is that, and Yvonne says this a lot, everybody has a tool in their toolbox to help. Uh, and, you know, sitting on the sidelines is really not an option anymore. Um, and I think that we, we hope people uh, feel inspired, um, empowered, and feel like they have some agency in the future of our planet. And if their actions are big or small, that use something in their toolbox um, to try to make the world a better place. For us, it's filmmaking. For someone else, it could be something else. But when there's a bit of hope, I, I think that can help trigger action. And, and we just hope that um, it, it does trigger action from people. I'm absolutely convinced it will. Thank you so much for, for joining us today, Jimmy and Chai. Thank you for this work. It's a beautiful, beautiful film. And thank you again to National Geographic Documentary. Yeah, Commission. thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And we love Doug NYC. And so thank you so much for taking up the helm. Like, you know, you can always count on us to support. So it's a big deal. Wonderful. Deeply appreciate you. Um, okay. Thank you to National Geographic Documentary Films. And um, thanks again for joining us for Spring Showcase, Doc NYC. Bye.